Foundation. And today we are going to look at Allison Weir's book. So check this out and uh, check us out at FamilyHistoryFoundation.com. And here we go. This is Queens of the Conquest, a book by Allison Weir. And it's my book review if you've read it. Um, see what you think. If you haven't, well, you're going to end up wanting to read it right after this. Um, so here we go. This is uh, my book review from my site. And uh, while you're here, if you like what you see and hear, uh, subscribe and like to this YouTube channel. Yeah, so uh, Alison Weir continues her four book series uh, entitled England's Medieval Queens with book two entitled Queen of Queens of the Crusades. Uh, the previous one, book one, was entitled Queens of the Conquest. Um, at, obviously, as the conquest came before the Crusades, um, which was published in 2017 and was superb. I have a link to that review as well in here. Spanning the first five queens of the Plantagenet era is this book, Queens of the Crusades, which was released in 2021. And you can see my ratings, how they're broken down. Um, rarely do I give out five whole stars for something but this one I did um, and as far as the rating sort of categories and weighting um, it kind of knocked the park knocked everything out of the park overall rating was five stars her writing style I mean it's just it's just phenomenal so that got five stars cool word usage is something that I'm always keen on what sort of vocabulary do the uh, writers have and how they use and weave in uh, words in a narrative, not over stuff words. So uh, cool word usage is, is a big sort of category for me. Uh, font size, which is like readability. Uh, if you're reading a book, a physical book, uh, chapter length is another sort of interesting facet to me. Like I hate super long chapters. Like if you can break it up a little bit more, it's a little bit better. Um, the index, you have to have a good index. Uh, I'm a scholar, we have to have good index indices. Uh, citations, of course, big, and collectability, which is kind of like a, almost like a global meta score because it's like, is it something that you would have to keep or something that you could easily pass on to somebody and not really care if you get back? <laughs> so collectability for me is the book nerd checklist part, which is like, do I need to keep this? And for this book, gotta have it uh, especially because it's part of a series and you gotta collect them all so book stats for queens of the crusades check this out <clears throat> published in 2021 in the u.s 2020 in the uk and also uh, noticed you will notice that there are different covers uh for each of those volumes um there are 533 total pages 452 pages of text which is pretty meaty uh, five parts, 34 chapters, one epilogue, one uh, bibliography, one sources of quotes in the text section. Very nice. Uh, and an index and hardcover available is always a good thing. So let's check out the book review here. <clears throat> and uh, so this Queens of the Crusades picks up where Queens of the Conquest left off. Uh, as book two in a four book series, this enchanting publication covers the period of the early Plantagenets. So if you are into the Plantagenet dynasty in England, this is actually for you. Uh, roughly between 1122 and 1290. Um, and again, I say the early period because the Plantagenet era actually ran past 1290, obviously. Um, so the span of reigns for these queens, because uh, it was centered around the crusading era, uh, was Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, wife of Henry II, Berengaria of Navarre, wife of Richard I, the Lionheart, and Isabella of Angoulême, wife of King John, um, Eleanor of Provence, another Eleanor, wife of Henry III, and Eleanor of Castile, wife of Edward I. So there's quite a few Eleanors in there. <laughs> um, and Matildas, as we're going to see. Um, and you... As this says here, uh, it covers the first or early Plantagenet queens, but you know one might also count Queen Maud, who was Matilda, uh, as both Norman and Plantagenet, as she was the wife of the eponymous Geoffrey Plantagenet and mother to Henry II. Uh, for further reading, 
if you want to sort of parse apart the many and numerous Eleanors and Matildas of this era, you can check this out. And I'll leave a link down in this YouTube video. But as a little preview, this is what the post looks like. Yeah, look at that. It actually has all of the genealogies and it goes over all of them one by one. So I think you really love that. Anyway, back to this article here. Um, I'll start with the negative, okay? Because there's a, there's one negative in this uh, Queens of the Crusades book. Um, and that is there are no genealogies. I do not understand why this is done in a book of such complexity and import where you need uh, to sort of lay out who is related to who. Not quite sure why this is not a functional part of this book. Um, and I don't understand as book one, Queens of the Conquest, um, had four whole pages of genealogies going on in here. And so I'm not sure what was going on. I mean, I'd love to sort of find out. But, uh, and the genealogies in the prior book do not apply as they predate the range of kings and queens covered in book two. Um, so that's the kind of negative. Um, but that aside, this book is a wonderful exposition behind the lives of the scenes of five of England's most prolific and powerful monarchs. Um, and it's just an absolute pleasure to read this. Um, and, you know, in line with this and why I like it so much is it sort of covers the range of narratives around a few of my favorite kings of England. I'm a big fan of the Plantagenets, uh, but King Henry II and King Edward I. Um, and of course, they enveloped the lives of the queens who sat on the throne next to them. So it's it was super, super fascinating reading about their lives. Um, so acclaimed author Alison Weir doesn't just write hagiographies, which is just sort of self-supported evidence to build somebody up. Um, they're, they're not there merely to praise their intended subjects. Um, Weir writes critically, uh, examining and confronting many long-held conceptions about each of her subjects. So this is really, really neat. Um, and she digs deeper into the role of Eleanor of Aquitaine um, and, you know, the fact that she was very mobile. Her realm had many land holdings. And, but Weir challenges the view that Eleanor had as large a role in the decision-making process as had been previously assigned to her. And this is kind of crucial because uh, we see Eleanor of Aquitaine sort of, you know, pushed up to the level of a living saint by the time uh, many historians are done with her. Um, and fair enough, because she was incredible. But I like the sort of fact that we are challenging some of these conceptions and brings out the facts to sort of elucidate either claim. Um, so, and... Uh, Speaking of Eleanor of Aquitaine, I, I do have a separate post and a video on 15 Eleanor of Aquitaine books historians have on their shelves. If you are a fan of this sort of uh, era, you definitely have to read this and check out all, all the resources there. I own every book on the list, too. Um, uh, when ex another example of uh, what I like about this is while Richard the Lionheart has been the subject of many biographies, his queen... Berengaria of Navarre has also been bandied about in many a volume on medieval England. Um, but who has been more of a mystery to me has always been Eleanor of Provence, wife and queen to Henry III. And I'm glad Alison Weir sort of, you know, lays bare a lot of what, uh, you know, information about her. Um, because King Henry III, as son of King John Lachlan and father to Edward I, King Henry II has too often been scrubbed out of history as a weak and flaccid king. Uh, his is said to be the rule of a weakling and pious person to the detriment of the English crown. And I've always thought, wait a bloody minute. <laughs> because uh, So understanding his queen, uh, the provincial version of Eleanor, 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 uh, was a breath of fresh air for me. Um, as was gaining a deeper understanding of the motivations of Henry III. He was trying to be the warrior king his grandfather was and avoid being the disaster his father was. And that had to have been a tough place to be. So I'm glad that Alison Weir talks about that um, throughout her book. Um, so in line with that thought is the overarching theme of this book. It is essentially about the queens of the crusading era, English queens, and their relationships with, with their husband kings. It's about the families, really, right? The two are inexorably connected. 
It really is something that will open any medieval or English historian's eyes to the full reality of rulership, family and decision making that happened during the Plantagenet era. And I'd like to end this little shindig here with two quotes, uh, both for Eleanor of Castile, wife and queen of Edward I, as one of England's most divisive and controversial kings. He was also one of my favorites. Go Edward I. Uh, let these quotes illustrate the impact his queen had on him. So again, whatever you think or know about Edward I, um, it really was these quotes sort of bring out the depth of who he was in a larger role. So arguably, uh, the first quote says, Eleanor of Castile brought out the best in Edward. His rule became harsher after his death. Uh, Weir, page 451. Within a century of Eleanor's death, her legend has become firmly entrenched in the public consciousness, and she had become to everybody the ideal queen. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Um, I, for one, am excited about the next two books. Uh, the third book has actually always, already been released, um, and you can sort of check out her website there, which I linked. And that's about it, the biography here. If you head over to Family History Foundation, you uh, will always get external links to Amazon or either a books or some other place if you want to sort of venture out and buy a copy. This is the cover of my book here, as you can see. So uh, thank you guys for listening.